Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper by looking at an article from the front page of the Delhi edition. The National Green Tribunal has directed the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Oil India Limited to explain as to how permission was granted for oil drilling projects near the ecologically sensitive Debru Saikova National Park of Assam. See, on the 26th of June, while taking up a practice question, we had discussed as to how the oil well blowout accident at Bagjan had affected the sensitive ecology of the Debru Saikova National Park, which also happens to be a biosphere reserve. Even after several weeks after the accident, Oil India Limited is still struggling to contain the oil well blowout and now it has been alleged that the project proponents had committed serious violations of the environment impact assessment process, thereby endangering the environment and biodiversity of this protected area. A group of petitioners have approached the National Green Tribunal alleging that Oil India Limited had violated the EIA process by not conducting the biodiversity assessment and by not holding the mandatory public hearing, which is a legal requirement as per the EIA process. When the EIA report was submitted, the project proponents had claimed that the threat of a blowout was very negligible. But now, the occurrence of this accident has directly threatened the sensitive environment and biodiversity of the Debru Saikova National Park and its wetlands. And it has also had an impact on the health and livelihood of the local villagers. So based on these allegations, the NGT has directed the Environment Ministry, the Oil India Limited and the State Pollution Control Authorities to explain as to how permission was granted to these oil drilling projects. Then in another case, the National Green Tribunal has decided to set up a committee to investigate the allegations of large-scale illegal coal mining that has been reportedly carried out by the northeastern coal fields in the ecologically sensitive Dehing Patkai Elephant Reserve of Assam. So in this context, let us take a more detailed look at the structure, mandate and functions of the National Green Tribunal. See, the National Green Tribunal was established in 2010 under the National Green Tribunal Act and its main mandate is to provide for the speedy disposal of environment-related cases. This landmark legislation was passed by the government in order to fulfill the fundamental right to a healthy environment which is integral to right to life that has been enshrined under Article 21 of the Indian Constitution. It is a statutory quasi-judicial body that specializes in environment-related matters and its main objective is to balance the needs of growth and conservation. The NGT has been mandated to protect the environment, to conserve the forests and other natural resources from the impact of economic growth and secure justice to the victims of environmental damage by ordering for compensation to be paid on the basis of the polluter pays principle. See, the need for a specialized tribunal for environment-related matters was felt because India's environment and biodiversity had come under a lot of threat as a result of rapid economic growth witnessed as a result of the LPG reforms. As the number of environment-related disputes increased, the burden of litigation was felt on the judiciary, that is the High Courts and the Supreme Court. And this not only led to a huge backlog of cases with severe consequences for growth and conservation, it also made the government and the judiciary realize that the regular judicial mechanism lacked the required expertise to deal with environment-related matters. So in order to provide for speedy environmental justice and in order to bring in specialization in matters concerning the environment and biodiversity, the National Green Tribunal Act was passed by drawing inspiration from Article 21, which provided for the establishment of the National Green Tribunal with exclusive jurisdiction over environment-related disputes. In order to provide for speedy justice, the Act mandates the National Green Tribunal to dispose all applications and appeals within six months of receiving them. As per the provisions of the Act, New Delhi serves as the principal place of sitting for the tribunal and it has four other benches located in four different zones of the country and they are based out of Bhopal, Pune, Kolkata and Chennai. Then in order to make itself more accessible to people from various nooks and corners of the country, the NGT and its benches follow the circuit procedure. Then please note that as per the NGT Act, the tribunal is not bound by the procedure that has been laid out under the Code of Civil Procedure of 1908, but instead 
it shall be guided by the principles of natural justice. This key provision provides the tribunal with a lot of flexibility that helps provide a positive bias in favour of environment protection. This allows the tribunal to not be bound by codified laws but instead be guided by the ethical values and due process that has been recognized under the principles of natural justice. Then finally, let's talk about the composition of the National Green Tribunal. See, the tribunal is headed by a chairperson who usually happens to be a retired judge of the Supreme Court. Then the chairperson is assisted by a set of judicial members and expert members and all of them, including the chairperson, enjoy a term of five years and they are not eligible for reappointment. When they are not eligible for reappointment, it allows the chairperson and the members to function independently in a free and fair manner without having any fear or without facing any conflict of interest. The chairperson is appointed by the Government of India after consulting the Chief Justice of India who would recommend the name of one retired Supreme Court judge. Then for the appointment of the judicial members and expert members, the Government of India constitutes a selection committee and based on the recommendations of the selection committee, a minimum of 10 or a maximum of 20 full-time judicial members and expert members are appointed to the National Green Tribunal. So the total strength of the NGT including the chairperson ranges from 21 to 41 and such a large strength is needed in order to man the five benches of the NGT. But unfortunately as of now the government has appointed only four judicial members and four expert members and this has directly affected the functioning of the NGT and this has led to a severe backlog of cases thereby threatening the cause of environment protection. The government has been criticized for not allowing the NGT to function at its full capacity and it has also been alleged that the government is trying to amend the NGT Act in order to take the teeth away from the National Green Tribunal for the sake of clearing the environmental hurdles posed to industrial projects. Now let's take up an article from page number 10 and an editorial from page number 6 related to the China-Bhutan border dispute. See, we have covered this topic in detail on the 6th of July so for the background to this topic, I would request you to go back and watch this analysis. These articles are related to the new claims that China has raised in the eastern sector of Bhutan. In the month of June, at the summit of the UNDP-led Global Environment Facility, Bhutan was seeking additional funding for environment protection activities at the Sakteng Wildlife Sanctuary that is located in the eastern sector of Bhutan. But to the shock and surprise of Bhutan and as well as India, China claimed that the areas around the Sakteng Wildlife Sanctuary belongs to Chinese territory and on the basis of this new claim, China tried to block funding to the Environment Conservation Project of Bhutan under the Global Environment Facility. This new claim of China in the eastern sector of Bhutan is quite shocking because until now, the border dispute between China and Bhutan was restricted to the western and the northern sectors. We had discussed the other day that until now, there were only three disputed areas between China and Bhutan and this included the Doklam Plateau located at the tri-junction of India, China and Bhutan. This falls under the western sector of the China-Bhutan border and then towards the northern sector, China and Bhutan have a dispute at two locations known as Jakar Long and Pasam Long. But the opening of a new front in the eastern sector of Bhutan, that too at the Sakteng Wildlife Sanctuary where China shares no border has raised a lot of concern in both India and as well as in Bhutan. India's concern is that China is deliberately opening a new front in the eastern sector of Bhutan because of its proximity to Arunachal Pradesh and especially Tawang. So the proximity of the Sakteng Wildlife Sanctuary to India's Tawang and the fact that China does not share any border at this region has given rise to speculation that the opening of this new border dispute by China is not really aimed at Bhutan but instead it could be aimed at India. Because see, China had never raised any claims in the eastern sector of Bhutan since the border talks began between the two countries in 1984. So after China raised this new dispute, both Bhutan and India have reacted very cautiously and they have not come out with any rash response. Initially, Bhutan rejected these Chinese claims and it expressed sensitivity towards Indian concerns which is in line with the close and intimate relationship that India and Bhutan share in the domain of foreign policy. As we discussed the other day, Bhutan seeks India's guidance in its foreign policy 
and even though it makes its foreign policy decisions on its own, it always consults with India and always displays sensitivity towards Indian concerns. But despite the fact that Bhutan does not share any official diplomatic ties with China, it has repeatedly raised these new claims over the last six weeks, causing a great deal of concern in both India and Bhutan. Since June, China has raised this issue three times and it has reminded Bhutan that the border disputes in the West, North and East can be resolved by going back to the packet solution which China had earlier recommended back in the 1990s, which had proposed an exchange of the disputed territories with China retaining the Western sector and Bhutan gaining control over the Northern sector. See, ever since the border talks began between China and Bhutan in 1984, China's prime focus has always been on gaining control over the Doklam Plateau that is located close to the strategic Chumbi Valley. So in the interest of retaining its hold over the Doklam Plateau, China has always shown willingness to give up its claims in the northern sector that is at Jakar Lung and Pasam Lung. The reason why China is so interested in the Doklam Plateau is because its strategic location near the Chumbi Valley, where the tri-junction between India, China and Bhutan exists, provides China a unique leverage against India. So for this reason, China has always sought to increase its hold over the Doklam Plateau and in the past, as a part of a package solution, it has shown willingness to give up its claims over Jakarlung and Pasamlung. Now, after raising a new claim in the eastern sector around the Sakteng Wildlife Sanctuary, China has reminded Bhutan of the package solution of the 1990s and this could possibly be an attempt to exert greater pressure on Bhutan and trade the northern and eastern sectors in favour of the western sector. Bhutan also feels that this could be a pressure tactic of China in order to push Bhutan to resume the border negotiations which have been stalled since the Doklam dispute of 2017. India on the other hand feels that by opening a new front in the eastern sector of Bhutan, China is trying to create a diversionary tactic in order to distract India with regard to its ongoing tensions in the Ladakh sector. India also believes that this could be a Chinese attempt to disrupt the friendly relations between India and Bhutan and this has also led to concerns in India that China is trying to push its claims over India's Arunachal Pradesh especially over the Tawang region. In this context, the editorial is asking both India and Bhutan to work closely and retain their close cooperation and not let China's pressure tactics disrupt the trust and faith that both the countries have on each other. Now it is all the more important for India and Bhutan to work together because at the Doklam Plateau, China has strengthened its military infrastructure after the Doklam dispute of 2017. So by opening a new front in the eastern sector of Bhutan, China could possibly push India and Bhutan to settle for a package solution that brings China closer to the strategic Chumbi Valley. So the best way to counter this new Chinese aggression is by insulating the India-Bhutan relationship from the pressure tactic of China and by stepping up collaboration between the two countries. Now let's take up a column from page number 6 written by Rajiv Bhargava. See, over the last few weeks, statues of controversial historical figures around the world have been toppled by anti-racism protesters who see these controversial historical figures as the oppressors of the weaker community. As a part of the Black Lives Matter protests seen in the United States and as well as around the world, a number of statues of controversial figures have been toppled and this includes the statue of Christopher Columbus who brought oppressive colonialism to North America and it also includes the statues of confederate generals who treated the blacks as slaves and contributed to the oppression and humiliation of the black community. A similar trend has been noticed in the United Kingdom as well, where statues of slave owners and controversial colonial figures who were involved in oppressing the weaker minority have been brought down by the protesters. In this context, the writer evaluates the deeply contested heritage surrounding statues and he examines whether the destruction of the statues of controversial historical figures is the only available approach. In this column, the writer is making a case for preserving or removing a person's statue based on the shared judgment of his contribution to collective life. See, in order to understand this argument, first we need to look at what these statues represent. See, statues, just like any other art form, represents an heritage symbol. And what constitutes heritage is always defined by the society 
and since the definition of heritage is a collective decision made by the society it will inevitably involve politics so it is the politics of the day which defines as to what are heritage symbols see if you look at any statue or any art form in a particular era it might be revered but in some other era it might be targeted then in some cases in the same given era a particular section of the society might revere the statue or the art form but another section of the society might target the art form of the statues so basically the argument is that defining heritage symbols is basically a subjective collective decision made by the society depending on the politics of the day these heritage symbols help us develop a collective self understanding of our identity and hence they are a source of pride take for example a heritage monument such as the raj ghat it is not just a tribute to the life and contribution of mahatma gandhi but it is also a representation of india's long struggle against colonialism so while few heritage symbols help us in developing a collective identity a few other symbols might be a reminder of the horrors of history because one should not forget that heritage is always a reflection of history and while evaluating historical events it is hard to be value neutral and it is very essential to view and analyze historical events from an ethical prism so that's the reason why we also have heritage symbols that expose the horrors of history and they seek to tender a public apology to the oppressed and the victimized take for example the holocaust memorial in berlin and the vietnam memorial in the united states these symbols represent a public apology from the wrongdoers to those who were victimized then it is also possible that the same heritage symbol which is worshiped by a few could be targeted by a few others if statues of mahatma gandhi are worshiped around the world there is also a section of the society that criticizes mahatma gandhi for his failings and this section tends to target the heritage symbols that represent the mahatma gandhi see if you evaluate the life of mahatma gandhi for example mohandas gandhi did not become the mahatma overnight initially he was just another ordinary man who held a number of prejudices and biases that the society had taught him being born into upper caste community mahatma gandhi was no stranger to having his own caste based prejudices and since he was foreign educated and since he had middle class aspirations he was also initially taken in by the colonial narrative so those who target the mahatma today in retrospect they seem to target these human failings of mahatma gandhi but as a fair observer one should not fail to acknowledge that mahatma gandhi himself disowned his past and he has brought this out clearly in his autobiography while leading india's freedom struggle throughout his journey he made it clear that he himself was ashamed of his past prejudices and he made a constant effort to reform himself which finally transformed him to the social icon that he is thus making him the mahatma and a source of inspiration for millions of people around the world including future leaders such as martin luther king nelson mandela etc it is in this context that the writer says while the society is deciding whether to preserve or remove a person's statue or remove any heritage symbol the collective societal decision should be based on the overall contribution of the historical figure to collective life see there is no doubt that slave owners confederate generals and colonial masters were oppressors of the native community and the black community according to the writer destroying their statues does not serve any purpose and in fact it takes away its heritage symbol heritage symbols of controversial figures may not inspire pride but it is a reminder of the horrors committed by them in the past the writer says that even if a decision has to be made to remove such statues then such decision should be based on public debate and collective consensus of the society because merely toppling a statue through an act of violence doesn't serve any purpose and it erodes the fight of the weaker sections against the oppressors he cites the example of how a public discussion was held in delhi in the 1960s to decide on the removal of the statue of george v which was located near the india gate this statue of george v was a representation of the colonial oppression against india but instead of merely toppling the statue or destroying the statue a collective decision was made to remove the statue from its place and this was a gentle reminder that monarchs and dictators and colonial masters have no place in a modern republic 
Now let's take up another column from page number 6 in which the writer is making a case for the establishment of a separate high court for the union territory of Puducherry. See, after Puducherry merged with the Union of India in 1962, it was established as a union territory under the provisions of Article 239A. Then later, the jurisdiction of the Madras High Court was extended to the union territory of Puducherry as well, thus depriving Puducherry the opportunity to have its own high court, even though Article 241 of the Indian Constitution provides for the establishment of a high court for union territories. The writer argues that the shared jurisdiction of the Madras High Court over Tamil Nadu and Puducherry has affected justice delivery as far as the residents of Puducherry are concerned. He says that as a result of the shared jurisdiction between Tamil Nadu and Puducherry, there is a huge backlog of cases at the Madras High Court and this is having an impact on the state of governance and rule of law in Puducherry. He also argues that since the Madras High Court is located far away in Chennai, it creates the issue of accessibility as well for the residents of Puducherry. So the cost and time involved in travel makes access to justice unaffordable, especially for the poor and weaker sections. Then he also points out that since the Madras High Court has very large administrative expenses, the cost is disproportionately shared between the large state of Tamil Nadu and the small union territory of Puducherry. The writer argues that this sharing of cost is a violation of the constitution because according to the constitution, when a common high court has been given shared jurisdiction over one or more states or union territories, then the administrative expenses has to be borne entirely by the state which is playing host to the principal seat of the high court. That is the state where the principal seat of the high court is located will have to bear the entire administrative expense on its consolidated fund. But the writer says that in violation of this constitutional provision, the large administrative expenses of the Madras High Court is disproportionately shared between Tamil Nadu and the Union Territory of Puducherry. So he argues that if a smaller High Court is set up with exclusive jurisdiction over Puducherry, then the smaller expenses will be charged entirely on the Consolidated Fund of India because Puducherry is a Union Territory. He also says that by establishing a dedicated High Court for Puducherry, the Puducherry government and the legislature can be held accountable and it will also help in promoting the fundamental rights of the people of Puducherry. The writer finally says that if a separate High Court is set up for Puducherry, then it will also strengthen the long-standing demand of the Union Territory for complete statehood. Next on page number 9, we have two important articles related to international relations. This article on the right refers to the continued push of the United States to bring India under an anti-China alliance such as the Quad or the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. The United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has called upon India to work closely with the United States to counter Chinese aggression by collaborating under the Quad Alliance and as well as at the World Intellectual Property Organization. But in a very interesting development, India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jai Shankar has pointed out that the United States should go beyond seeking alliances. And just a couple of days ago, he had even publicly stated that India shall never be a part of any alliance system. These statements of India's foreign minister acquire a great deal of significance because it is a reiteration of the foundational principle of India's foreign policy. See, since the days of Prime Minister Nehru, Indian diplomacy has been rooted in the principle of strategic autonomy. Irrespective of the party in power, successive Indian governments have stuck to this principle of strategic autonomy which refers to the preservation of India's autonomy and independence with regard to its foreign policy decisions. And this foundational principle helps Indian diplomacy to strive towards the protection and promotion of India's national interests without having to be a part of any alliance or without being seen as an ally of any superpower. If you want to look at India's principle of strategic autonomy in practice, take a look at how India balances its relations with the United States and Russia. Take a look at how India strikes a balance in its relations with Israel and the Arab states. Also look at how India and China cooperate and collaborate together at a number of international institutions even though they have standing border disputes and frequent border tensions. So this goes on to show that over the last 70 odd years of being independent and sovereign, India has by and large pursued an independent autonomous foreign policy without being seen as an ally of any other major power. This has been made possible because of India's firm belief in the principle of strategic autonomy, whose sole objective 
is to protect and promote India's self-interest or India's national interest. Now let's take up the practice questions for today. Which article or articles prevent the courts from sitting in judgment over the internal proceedings of the parliament and the state legislature? Is it article 110 or article 122 or article 212 or both B and C? The correct answer is option D, both B and C respectively. See article 122 applies for the parliament whereas article 212 applies for the state legislature. These articles prevent the judiciary or the courts from sitting in judgment over the internal proceedings of the parliament and the legislature respectively. This question has been asked because we have an article on page number 1 that refers to the ongoing political crisis in Rajasthan. This political crisis has brought up a debate on the provisions of article 212. Now let's take up the next practice question. In a serological survey for COVID-19, if the test result of a person turns out to be positive, then what does it mean? The correct answer is option C. It means that the person has developed antibodies against the novel coronavirus. See, a serological survey is conducted in order to determine the extent of spread of an infectious disease in a given population. Under this survey, a blood serum sample is taken from a sample size population and it is tested for the presence of antibodies and if the test result turns out to be positive, then it means that the person who went through the serological survey has already been exposed to the pathogen and his immune system has already generated antibodies against the infection. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 3, the government of Delhi shall be holding a serological survey every month in order to determine the extent of spread of COVID-19 in its population. Now let's take up the next practice question. Recently, the Lonar Crater Lake in Maharashtra had turned pink in color and the reason has been attributed to the production of a pink pigment by the Haloarchaea bacteria which is usually found in water saturated with salt. Option C is the right answer. See, we had covered this strange development at the Lonar Crater Lake in detail on the 13th of June. In this analysis, we had discussed that experts initially had attributed this strange development to the possible presence of the Duna Liela algae which produces a red pigment. But now, laboratory studies have confirmed that the water of the Lonar Crater Lake turned pinkish in color due to the production of a pink pigment by the Halo Archaea bacteria which is usually found in water that is saturated with salt. This question has been asked because we have a related article on page number 5. Now let's take up the next question. A dedicated digital economy ministerial meeting takes place under which international platform? The correct answer is option C. It is under the G20. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 15, the Union Minister for Information Technology and Telecom, Mr. Ravi Shankar Prasad, has taken part in the virtual meeting of the G20 Digital Economy Ministers meeting. During this meet, the Union Minister has called upon e-platforms to be sensitive about defence and privacy concerns. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are correct? Madhubani art is a type of cloth-based embroidery. It is practiced in Bihar and is also known as Mithila art. Madhubani art has received geographical indication status or the GI tag. It is done by using the paste of powdered rice. Madhubani art depicts only deities from ancient epics. Amongst the given statements, the first and the fifth statements are incorrect. So option C is the right answer. See, Madhubani art is a type of painting. It is practiced in Bihar in the Madhubani district, which is a part of the historic Mithila region. That's the reason why Madhubani paintings are also referred to as Mithila paintings or the Mithila art. These paintings not only depict the deities from ancient epics, but they also depict the regular life of people, various animals and birds, and special ceremonies at royal courts and marriages. This question has been asked because we have an article on page number 16, which refers to how a Madhubani artist has turned the livelihood adversity created by the COVID-19 pandemic into an opportunity by painting Madhubani motifs on facial masks. Now let's take up a practice question from the 2016 films paper. Why does the government of India promote the use of neem-coated urea in agriculture? The correct answer is option B. Because neem coating slows down the rate of dissolution of urea in the soil. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, write a note on the National Green Tribunal with special emphasis on its mandate and structure. 
The second question, of late, statues of few historical figures around the world have become deeply contested heritage. Preserving or removing a person's statue must rely on shared judgment of his contribution to collective life. Comment. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.